Okay, what's going on guys? And welcome to our first leg day of the Ultimate Push-Pull Leg Series. In this video, we're doing six lower body exercises that target the quads, hamstrings, glutes, and calves. And then we're finishing things off with one exercise for the abs. All right, so as usual, we're starting with a quick general warm up. This is especially important on leg day because it's literally half your body. So I'll do a solid five to 10 minutes on the treadmill or Stairmaster, and then go through a quick series of dynamic stretches that I'll put up here on the screen. It looks like more than it is. It usually only takes me about two minutes tops. From there, we're jumping into just one heavy set of two to four reps on the squat. Remember, in this push-pull legs routine, we're using a minimalistic approach to strength and an optimization approach to hypertrophy. So for the squat, bench press, and deadlift, we're just doing one hard set per week. That's it. And then we'll do two back off sets with some variation for each lift. So here I'll do a pyramid warm up and weight across four or five warm up sets, as you can see here on the screen, until I get to my working weight, which will be something in the range of 85 to 90% of my one rep max for two to four reps. So let's say your one rep max is 405 pounds. You'd want to choose a weight around 345 pounds to 365 pounds for your top set of two to four reps. This shouldn't be an RPE 10 max effort set, but it should be something around an RPE of eight or nine. So you don't want to be leaving more than one or two reps in the tank. And remember, we're only doing one set, so it does need to be challenging. Now, if you're someone who only cares about building muscle and couldn't care less about strength, or if you can't squat or simply don't want to squat, you can replace the squat work with hack squats as a first substitution option, or Bulgarian split squats as a second option. In either case, to make it a bit more hypertrophy focused, you can just boost the rep range to four to six reps instead of two to four reps and keep everything else the same. After the heavy top set, we're doing two back off sets for five reps on the paused squat, where we'll be pausing for about one to two seconds in the hole on each rep. For these, you'll wanna drop the weight back to about 75% of what you did for your heavy top set. So let's say you did 365 pounds for your top set, you do around 275 pounds for your paused squats for five reps. For these, you wanna take in a big breath at the top and then sit back and down between your legs, keeping your breath held as you pause for one to two seconds and then explode up out of the hole with as much explosive force as possible. As you explode up, try to keep in mind that the bar should travel in as close to a straight line as possible, centered over the middle of your foot. And in general, I like pause squats because doing five paused reps is a lot harder than doing five normal reps. That's because when you pause, you lose any stored elastic energy in your tendons, which forces your quads and glutes to overcome the load from a dead stop. And because they're so much harder, this means you're forced to use lighter weights, which means you can get the same hypertrophic stimulus with lighter loads and less overall joint and body stress. Pausing also helps ensure that you're reaching proper depth on each and every rep and can help ingrain good technique habits for any heavier sets you do as well. Okay, after squats, we're moving on to three sets of eight to 10 reps on the barbell Romanian deadlift. Just a quick technique recap here. You wanna lift the barbell off the rack, take two or three steps back, push your hips back as the weight drops down, and then reverse the motion once the bar gets somewhere between just below knee level and mid shin level, or at least before your lower back starts to round. Then you should reverse the motion by lifting your chest up and thrusting your hips forward. A little knee bend is fine, but you should try to keep a more or less vertical shin angle, keeping the bar in tight and centered over the middle of your foot. Now, there are two common concerns I hear about RDLs. The first is that some people say they only feel it in their lower back, not in their hamstrings. And if this applies to you, the first thing I do is make sure that you're not letting the barbell drift forward away from your legs. This can cause the low back to take over in order to pull the bar back in. Remember that the bar should be moving straight up and straight down. I also find that wearing a belt can help with this issue, even though EMG data shows that overall wearing a belt shouldn't substantially reduce lower back muscle activity, I do find it helps me to direct more attention to my hamstrings and reduces that uncomfortable lower back pump that you can sometimes feel with RDLs. Now, obviously the spinal erectors have to contract on RDLs to prevent you from just curling over. So it's impossible to completely take the lower back out, but you can shift the emphasis to the hamstrings a bit more with those two tips. Another common question I get is how to target the hamstrings more versus the glutes more with RDLs. This one's pretty simple. If you wanna target your glutes more, think about squeezing your glutes to move the weight, and then you can optionally squeeze your glutes together at the top of the lift. That glute squeeze, honestly, probably isn't doing a whole lot on its own, but can help some people sort of find the muscle better. With this cue, you can almost think of the lift more like a vertical hip thrust. On the other hand, if you wanna make it more hamstring dominant, I would just completely cut out the top 10 to 25% of the lift. This will keep more of the emphasis on the hamstring stretch in the bottom half, and you can even add a little pause at the bottom to accentuate the stretch further. 
All right, so after that, we're moving on to two sets of 10 reps per leg on the dumbbell walking lunge. So that's 20 total strides per set. For this one, I figured I'd highlight three things that you should avoid when doing walking lunges. First, avoid cutting your depth short. Notice that on each and every rep, my knee softly makes contact with the floor. It's very common for people to start limiting their depth toward the end of the set once the reps start getting really hard, but it's a lot better to be more consistent with your reps rather than just aiming for an arbitrary rep count while cutting many of those reps short. Now, if you're afraid of hurting your knees on the floor, you may be making the second mistake on my list, which is free falling on the negative. A lot of people try to rush through their lunges because they are a fairly gruesome exercise, but despite that, you should think of them like you should any other hypertrophy focused movement where you're actively controlling and resisting the negative. If you're letting gravity take over on the negative, then you're missing out on the most important aspect of the lift. So take your time and be intentional with every rep you do. And the third thing to avoid is letting your grip strength limit the load that you can use. A lot of people go way too light on walking lunges. They end their set once they feel fatigued, but don't actually approach muscular failure. One of the main reasons for this is that they just pick up some relatively light dumbbells that they can grip easily. But we're not trying to train our forearms here. So if your grip is a limiting factor, I definitely recommend strapping in and using some dumbbells that'll actually get your legs close to failure by the end of the set. Okay, after that, we're moving on to three sets of 10 to 12 reps on the seated leg curl. Another couple quick tips here. First, remember that there was a study published in 2021, which found that seated leg curls led to about 56% more muscle growth than lying leg curls across a 12 week training study. And the most likely reason for this is that the seated leg curl was challenging the hamstrings in a more lengthened position than the lying leg curl. In other words, you can load the hamstrings with more stretch when you're seated than when you're lying. However, if you set the seat too far back, you actually lose a lot of that stretch. So you wanna make sure that your torso is positioned far enough forward on the machine that you feel a solid stretch in your hamstrings before you start the set. If you don't feel any stretch in your hamstrings in the starting position, you may not have the seat up far enough, or you may want to lean forward over the machine a bit until you feel that tug of passive tension in your hamstrings. Also remember that the hamstrings cross both the hip joint and the knee joint. So pointing the toes in or out by rotating the legs at the hip does seem to impact which area of the hamstrings is emphasized. At least EMG evidence shows that the inner hamstrings activate more when the toes are pointed in and the outer hamstrings activate more when the toes are pointed out. So for this one, you can think of pointing your toes in the direction of the region you're trying to emphasize. Point them out for the outer hamstrings and point them in for the inner hamstrings. Of course, because EMG readings have never been formally validated as being predictive of long-term hypertrophy outcomes, you should think of this suggestion as just something to play around with rather than a proven fact. But since we're doing three sets here anyway, why not point the toes slightly out for the first set, slightly in for the second set, and then straight ahead for the third set. Of course, if you feel your hamstrings working much better with one toe position over the others, I'd simply roll with that one. And if either position feels awkward or uncomfortable for you, there's no reason that you have to do it, but assuming they all feel fine to you, why not switch it up from set to set for some variety? Okay, up next, we're doing four sets of 10 to 12 reps on the leg press, toe press. And I like doing this movement for the calves because after a high volume leg day like this one, you can just sit down and give your back and your hips a little break while you focus entirely on the calves. Now, similar to the leg curl, pointing your toes in different directions can impact which region of the calves are emphasized, except unlike with the leg curl, we can say this with much more confidence for the calves because we actually have a long-term training study that measured muscle growth directly. This is a figure from a 2020 study that had 22 subjects train their calves for nine weeks with either their feet pointed out, feet pointed in, or feet pointed straight ahead. And as you can see in the figure, pointing the toes out grew the medial or inside part of the calves better, while pointing the toes in grew the lateral or outside part of the calves better and pointing them straight ahead grew both the inside and the outside pretty evenly. So this tells us that if you're trying to grow the outer calves a bit more, you should consider pointing your toes in. If you're trying to grow the inner calves a bit more, maybe so they're more visible from the front, you should try pointing your toes out. And since we're doing four sets here, we might as well experiment with the different positions. So I'd suggest pointing them out for set one, pointing them in for set two, and then pointing them straight ahead for set three and four. Or again, similar to the leg curl, if either position feels particularly awkward for you or significantly limits the amount of load you can use, I just go with the position that you feel strongest and most comfortable with. And then to finish off the workout, we're doing three sets of 10 to 12 reps on the decline plate crunch. I find that direct ab work doesn't fit perfectly into either the push, pull, or leg day, but I tend to put ab work on my leg days just because most ab work will also work the hip flexors, which will be nice and warmed up after all that leg work. 
So for this one, you wanna hold a plate to your chest and focus on squeezing your abs together. Don't just hinge at your hips, that'll mostly target the hip flexors. Instead, allow your lower back to round as you squeeze your six pack together. And over time, you should be keeping track of the weights you're using and the number of reps you're hitting while aiming to add either some weight or a rep from session to session. This will ensure that you're actually progressively overloading your abs and triggering their development. And just a few overloading sets like this will do a whole lot more for increasing that pop factor on your midsection than pretty much any amount of cardio style ab circuits will and in a fraction of the time. Okay, so after this leg day, we've got the first half of the full week of training completed, and I'll be covering the remaining three workouts in three upcoming videos here on the channel. But if you'd like to have the full 12 weeks of training all in one place right away, you can pick up the full Ultimate Push-Pull Legs Hypertrophy System over on jeffnipper.com. The program comes with a full ebook explaining all the methods used in the program, an Excel spreadsheet, a library full of exercise demos from me, coaching cues for every exercise, and plenty more. It also comes in a four day, five day, and six day per week version. So you can still run the program even if you don't have six days per week available to train. So I'll leave a little more info about that in the description box down below. And that's it for this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys all here in the next one.